Thanks so much for having me. Um, I guess I want to talk a little bit more about the relation of violence in the imagination and, and how I, I first kind of came to thinking about the matter. It's often said that um, it's really the unsuccessful political actions, moments of political frustration when you feel stymied in some way that are really creative of new radical intellectual ideas. You know. Marx wrote Capital after the failure of the one round of revolutions, and it, th that pattern seems to repeat over and over again. I, I don't think I've ever come up with anything on quite that scale. Um, but I have noticed that some of my um, most enduring insights come out of incidents where things went terribly wrong in some way. Um, and um, one of them actually was one of the most sort of depressing um, political actions I ever uh, engaged in. It was right after 9-11. Um, there was going to be a huge uh, anti-IMF World Bank meeting um, action in Washington, D.C., which was scheduled for what turned out to be um, three or four weeks, I think, after uh, the attack on the World Trade Center. And um, you know, when that happened, we obviously realized we weren't going to be doing mass uh, direct action of the sort of rowdy sort we wanted to do, but we kind of wondered whether we should do the event at all. Um, a lot of people wanted to call it off, but we thought, well, you know, here's a moment where, especially if you're an anarchist in America and living in a town like, you know, a, a small town or even small city, if you're in Lawrence, Kansas, and there's like, you know, five other anarchists, or, um, you know, you, you're probably pretty alienated, depressed, and, and even scared right now. So, you know, just bringing everybody together would probably be something reassuring for everyone, um, whatever the circumstance. So we all showed up, and we just figured, oh, we'll just do a march, you know. Um, and the event was extraordinary. There was about maybe uh, 2,000 anarchists maximum. There were at least 8,000 police. Um, <laughs> police were armed to the teeth. Um, they and and but the interest and, and you know they were just looking for an excuse to beat us up, um, which of course we didn't afford them one. But but they actually marched us. They kind of steered us all on their own path, uh, d determined path, um, since they had such overwhelming numbers and armored vehicles and all that sort of thing. Um, and they put us right next to the World Bank building. Um, which we'd never been allowed anywhere near before, uh, oh, partly owing to the fact that the World Bank building is entirely made of glass. <laughs> um, so, so here they just basically parked us next to this giant glass building and then surrounded and kettled us and wouldn't let us go for two hours. Um, sort of like, come on, give us an excuse. Um, and obviously, we weren't that stupid, so there was this standoff. We all sat there being very depressed and eventually, I actually called 9-11, I remember that. Uh, um, I'd never done that before I called an emergency and said, help, help, we were being surrounded by men with guns. Come save us. Uh, <laughs> just to see what they would do. They're also so bored. Other people ordered a pizza. Um, and um, eventually they let us go, and we all went home and were kind of depressed, and it was a miserable day. Um, and um, But what the real revelatory thing was is afterwards I talked to a friend who was actually married to someone, uh, no, she, she had a friend who was married to someone who actually went to the World Bank meetings that were happening at that time. And all, it said all they all did was complain about how utterly miserable and horrible it was. They said, you know, there was like 17 layers of security. There was, um, you know, all the parties and the fun stuff was canceled. Half of them couldn't even get into town. They telecommuted. They all had to go through layer on layer of, 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 of Pat downs and searches and electrical things, um, and and you know they just we, they just totally destroyed the meetings, which hardly took place. And I thought about that, and I thought that's fascinating. Um, I mean, think about that. Like the World Bank and the IMF are two of the very most powerful organizations in the entire world, um, and they were like the the police and general authorities were willing to shut down their annual shindig and their party and make them all miserable just so that 2,000 anarchists could have a really bad day. <laughs> well, they must think we're really important. <laughs> I mean, think about that. You know, we're, we go around thinking we're really pathetic most of the time. But, you know, like the most powerful people on Earth, you know, have just told the second most powerful group of people on Earth that, they, you know, they should not have any fun, just make us miserable. So why is it so important for them that, that we're miserable? Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I think that that one incident represents a kind of key to ruling class strategies over the last, at least since the 1960s. Um, 
you know, there's this kind of preemptive attitude. It is absolutely critical that people who organize to present some sort of radical it, uh, alternative to the established order do not have the feeling of agency and of having a fun time. It's so important that they don't, that they're willing to sacrifice almost anything to make sure nobody ever has that experience. Um, and it started, like all sorts of other things started falling into place. Why is it that the US w lost the war in Iraq? Because, you know, by any standard, it was a complete military catastrophe, you know. You now have Iraq divided between, you know, one force which is like to the right of Al Qaeda, you know, even, and then another force which is allied with Iran. Um, you know, it's like couldn't have been more geopolitically dis um, destructive. And, and why did it happen? Basically, what it happened because the entire U.S. strategy of waging war in Iraq was based on preventing any sort of Vietnam-type social movement at home. I mean, they had calculations, like how many body bags equals how many protesters. Um, they wrote this stuff up. You can find it. Um, and they designed their entire strategy of the occupation to guarantee that there aren't very many American casualties, especially death. Um, and so as to prevent any sort of um, resistance and organization at home. Because all these guys had gone to college in the 60s, you know, um, and they remembered it, and this is very vivid in their imaginations, um, as the very thing they most want to make sure doesn't happen again. As a result, they set up terms of engagement, which guaranteed that um, to minimize American military casualties, they just killed endless numbers of Iraqi civilians, which made everybody hate them so much they basically lost the war. But it was more important to them, again, to prevent um, any sort of social movement from happening at home than actually winning a military con uh, conflict overseas. It's almost as if the, I wrote somewhere, the um, American military in Iraq was actually defeated by the ghost of Abby Hoffman, which terrified them and sort of haunted them during the entire time. Um, so, so that preemptive um, attitude, that it seems absolute linchpin of ruling class strategies that no sort of large-scale alternative movement or not only arise but also feel good about itself, feel plausible. Um, that, that feeling of hopelessness seems to be absolutely central to, to the, their design. Um, and they're willing to sacrifice almost anything in order to be able to achieve it. So, so that was the first insight. Um, and the second one actually has to do with the way in which this kind of war of violence and the imagination becomes implicated even in our sort of everyday perceptions of the world around us. And that actually came from another rather disastrous uh, event, which was the Direct Action Network, this um, group that I was involved with, it's a basically anarchist group. Um, they um, decentralized a directly democratic network based on, on consensus process. Um, we had this small crisis around that same time when somebody gave us a car. And it's interesting because, um, you know, it seemed like a great idea. They gave the, uh, uh, we quickly realized that it's actually created endless problems because, you know, a, a decentralized, directly democratic network can't own a car. You know, if you have a car, it has to be owned by a person, it has to be owned by an individual or a legal entity equivalent to a, an individual such as a corporation. If we had incorporated ourselves, we could own a car. But if we'd incorporated ourselves, then we'd have to have like a whole hierarchical structure and different, we'd have to have a treasurer, we'd have to have a president and vice president. Um, and and that those rules and regulations in, um, you know, are enforced ultimately by violence, I mean, as we quickly learned, because you know a car is a big heavy thing that you know you can't really hide very well, or if you hide it, then it's not much use having it. Um, so you know we said, all oh, right, we'll get one guy and he'll he'll be the car committee, and we'll make believe he's it. You know, but even then, like in order for somebody else to drive it, since he was a legal owner, he had to give like right permission if they were going out of state, and it just became more and more complicated. Um, and and finally, you know, the car was such a problem um, that. We figured the only thing we could do would be to do a fundraiser where we like charged everybody five bucks to um, and gave them a sledgehammer to like destroy the car, um, which was fun. But it just showed that like you know it's just not viable. Um, but the the reason it wasn't viable was not because there's anything intrinsically difficult about a directly democratic network you know, managing a car. We manage much, much more complicated things. It's because the moment you have large, heavy objects, they fall under government regulation in various ways. And that regulation is ultimately enforced by violence. And, and that violence is the sort of thing that we don't think about, you know. Because every aspect of the regulation of our physical environment is enforced by endless, endless laws, regulations, um, statutes, 
which become almost naturalized into the very solidity and heaviness of the objects themselves. This is why, like, you know, radical forms of organization seem unrealistic, um, as we're always told. It's not because they don't work. You know, we've been, like, running circles around the police and doing all sorts of, like, remarkable things um, using directly democratic organization. It works much better than hierarchical systems in terms of organizing stuff. But the moment you get a building, you know, the moment you get a car, the moment you get a thing, everything seems to go haywire. And, and the reason why is, you know, if you get a squat legalized, then the building code guy comes and says, well, you're not up to code on the fire stuff, and suddenly you have to organize bake sales and enter the market to, like, raise all the $20,000 required to fix a stairway and you know, all that stuff they never do if you're an evil landlord. They start to do, do on you if you're an anarchist who has a squat. Um, so, you know, suddenly you seem to enter the world of real heavy stuff. And like suddenly, um, none of this, 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 this fantasy utopian um, democratic stuff seems to work. Um, and, and I became convinced that, that this has an emor enormous ideological effect. I mean, we never think about this, the fact that violence sort of fills our world and it becomes especially sort of caught in, in the solidity of things around us um, because I mean, you don't realize it until you're in a place where it isn't true. I lived in Madagascar for a couple of years, and um, you know, I was in a small town in a village and where the cops had basically gone away, and insofar as they were around, they didn't enforce stupid rules about how high signs could be or what your stairs are supposed to be like or you know, what you can drink where and here, what you can smoke where and how you have to stand in this place to do that thing. And, you know, and we don't realize that like, every aspect of, of, of our everyday conduct and anything we consider public space, which of course in Madagascar is all space because people don't really hang around in side very much, um, is, is regulated by laws which, you know, there's a guy with a stick who will come and ultimately beat you up if you break them. And we don't think about it because we never actually do that, unless you're an anarchist, and then you actually will sometimes, you know, actually see what will happen if you refuse to take down the sign. And yeah, they will. They will eventually start hitting you. Um, so, so I realize that, that that violence becomes sort of incorporated into our world in ways we don't recognize it. Even the phrase structural violence. It's always frustrated me that, like, you know, I used to think what structural violence meant, and I still do, um, I used to think other people thought what structural violence meant was exactly that, the way that, um, you know, there are forms of inequality and oppression which are ultimately displacements of, of physical violence. So, you know, racism is a form of structural violence. Sexism, patriarchy is a form of structural violence. But, you know, it, it doesn't ex but the, the sort of liberal definition, the definition everybody uses is that these things exist because they are forms of inequality that have violent effects. You know, racism causes people to get sick and die, and um, it causes terrible things to happen to people, causes them to be get shot by police. Um, but in fact, um, it's, it's actually the violence which holds the whole thing together. In a way, they're displacements of violence, um, insofar as, you know, were there not a, a structure of violence already existing, these things like wouldn't make any difference. And um, they're all ultimately based on um, larger structures whereby violence is systematically deployed. Um, and and you know, the reason you don't see it is because it, it works best when, when the violence isn't actually deployed. You know, when, when there's real physical violence going on, it's because those structures of violence aren't particularly effective. Um, um, how to start with this? Um, an example might be, well, it all has to do with the nature of violence, and this is where I eventually went with this. Um, I realized that the, the difference between imagination of violence, uh, when I started contemplating this, ran much, much deeper than I'd imagined, um, and that these were alternative principles in a way that I hadn't thought. And, you know, I'm an anthropologist, and for anthropologists, everything's really about symbols, imagination, um, and the literature on violence that exists in anthropology is all about how violence is symbolic, how violence is communicative. But it occurred to me when I was um, considering some of these phenomena, and it all started with the car, and, um, and the way that violence sort of disappears around us as a way of enforcing rules, that What's really interesting about violence, I mean, it's true, violence is communicative, like, um, you know, m if you blow something up, you're doing it to scare people, generally speaking. If you shoot someone, it's to give an example. There's a whole literature on the symbolism and sort of various different forms of, of, of terrorism, basically, you know, used, deployed by violent people. But it's also, 
true that violence is almost unique among um, social action groups that in part that's not true. You know, if you say something is symbolic or communicative as a form of action, you're not saying very much because all forms of action are symbolic and communicative. And um, what's interesting about violence is that it's the only form of, of action that has any real chance of having a systematic uh, and predictable effect on others uh, without the medium of, of symbolic um, communication of any kind. And that could be very minimum, like, you know, they're doing something, you shoot them and they stop because they're dead. Um, but nonetheless, it's fairly predictable. And, and that very fact about violence actually gives it a quality which um, almost all other forms of action lack, which is that you can have relatively predictable for, uh, effects on the actions of other people about whom you understand nothing. You know, any other way you want to actually affect some other person's actions, you have to have some idea of what they think is going on, who they think they are, who they think you are, what they want, what they, what they fear. But, you know, if you shoot them or hit them hard enough, that, that kind of becomes irrelevant. Uh, this is why violence is the preferred weapon of the stupid. Um, but there's another catch to that, and well, one reason why we don't notice this, because you know, insofar as two people are roughly equally matched in their capacity for violence, you know, if I'm having a duel with you or, you know, you're Rommel and I'm Patton and we're having a tank battle or something, well, yeah, I've got to figure out what's going on in your head. Um, I do have to actually imagine and do that work of imagining another person, um, you know, to imagination. Um, if, on the other hand, I have utter disproportionate means of violence and you don't, I don't have to do much imagining. I realize that like everyday life is based on a constant labor of the imagination. We're almost overwhelmed by Im imaginative responsibilities. We have to constantly think about all the people around us and what they think is happening, um, imagine their perspectives, and it's, it's, it's completely impossible, I mean, you know, to actually simultaneously imagine what even a quarter of the people in this room, even a, a tenth probably, are all, you know, thinking at the same time. So you have to have various shorthand uh, techniques. But there's a, really there's, a, there's a phenomenon of imaginative labor that we're all engaged in at, at any given time. Um, and, and what violence does, and, and rules enforced by violence, there's one of the few means that you can totally cut through that. I don't, you know, care what you're thinking. Um, and, <coughs> <coughs> and set up struck, but however, again, um, owing to the fact that it only really works when one side has a disproportionate uh, ability to appeal to violence, it's precisely in situations of structural violence, such as I've uh, uh, defined them, that you don't actually see the physical violence going on, but where this is the most effective. And thus, and feminist standpoint theory, for example, has pointed this out ages ago, um, and th the thought in itself is nothing new. In a way, Foucault gets things backwards, um, or a sort of vulgar Foucauldian literal reading of him saying that all forms of power are forms of knowledge. Well, yeah, that's true, but often they're really simplistic, stupid forms of knowledge, and the really sophisticated forms of knowledge are the people on the bottom who are being analyzed who have to manage the stupidity of those who have access to violence on the top. I mean, you know, anybody who's had a job where somebody has the arbitrary power to fire you knows that like the workers have to know what's going on and the boss doesn't. And similar with gender relations, you know, in any patriarchal society, um, women know what's going on in men's heads much, much more than men go what's going on in women's heads. And, you know, men will always make jokes about, oh, you can't figure out women, they're such strange creatures in a situation where men have basically arbitrary power over them. Women never say that about men because they actually have to understand men. Um, so, so that like, um, and this is this is what I was referring to when I, I, I talked about the sort of um, fractured structures of imagination. Um, you know, in most social situations involving structural violence, the people on the bottom, um, and I've read um, African American authors write about the same thing about the elaborate ethnographies that in in uh, the old South black communities would have trying to like figure out how white people think. You know, they have these very, very elaborate ethnographies of, of white people, because you need to do that, whereas, you know, the white communities just had no idea what, what was going on. Um, almost always people on the bottom actually have more knowledge, have to do more imaginative labor. So the imagination gets displaced onto the bottom. As a result, and this is where you get back to that notion of, of reality and large objects, um, that there is also a, um, you know, right-wing and left-wing political thought is all about recognizing different aspects of, of that, um, of that complex relation of imagination and violence that takes place in situations of structural inequality. I, I, I coined uh, somewhat pretentious terms 
political ontologies of violence versus political ontologies of the imagination. Um, and normally I, I despise people who use the word ontology too freely. Um, it annoys me. But in this case, I actually think that it does apply because you know what it's about is one sense of what's really real. You know, when people say, oh, come on, be realistic, um, what reality are they actually referring to when they say, oh, come on, be realistic? Um, if you're a right-wing person, you're basically talking about violence. You know, take the idea of international relations. There's institutionalists and realists, right? Realists are people who say that nation states will um, do whatever they have to do to pursue their interests. You know, they're uh, essentially calculating self-interested actors. Um, it's the more cynical approach. But if you think about it, um, you know, what's realistic about the idea of a nation state? Nation states don't exist. They're completely imaginary entities. Um, there's no such thing as France. I mean, the king of France, you could say, has interests, right? But France doesn't have interests. Um, you know, why does France appear to have interests? Why does France appear to be an international actor? Uh, well, because France can kill you. I mean, it has an army. Um, so, you know, it's real because it can do destructive, violent things. Um, and this applies on every level. Even when we talk about real estate, you know, the large and heavy objects. You know, real estate comes from, it doesn't actually come from res, uh, uh, the Latin word for, for thing, uh, like most of our uses of real. It actually comes from real, belonging to the king. His sovereign power ultimately owns, you know, since the king has ultimate coercive power over everything, he can take whatever he likes so that all large heavy objects ultimately belong to the king. Um, now, so that's a sort of political ontology of violence. If you look at the you know, sort of right-wing conceptions, um, the assumption is always that the ultimate reality is one of force, and we just have to deal with that. Um, there's different branches of that. Oh, um, well, oh, the other al aspect of this is the assumption that if you do bring imagination into the political sphere, the results are likely to be disastrous. I always talk about like superhero comics as actually revealing a lot of this tacitly right-wing ideology. It's, it's kind of interesting because if you think about it, um, in a you know, sort of classic Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, old-fashioned um, sort of genre stuff, um, you know, the only really imaginative characters are, are the bad guys, right? I mean, the only people, who, because, you know, think about it, Superman, he could do anything, and he has no, the guy has no imagination. You know, he's just sitting around, all he can think to do is, is fight crime. Um, all these guys have these enormous powers. They could be doing uh, like amazing things, and they never do. Um, they just sort of intervene to like keep things kind of the same. The you know the, the bad guys they have imagination, but it always leads to you know sort of so you identify with them at first, right? Because they're having fun at least and have projects and plans. Uh, but it's ultimately disastrous. So then you finally have to sort of they're the kind of libido, and you re-identify with, with, with the superheroes who, who beat them back into submission. Um, but if you think about it, they're the ones who are actually applying imagination on a uh, on a cosmic or national or political scale. Whereas, like the superheroes, what, what they can be imaginative, but it's entirely confined to what their clothes, their cars, their you know their paraphernalia, basically consumption stuff, their houses. You know, they have a bat cave. So you know that seems to be the message, right? It's like com confine the imagination to the consumer domestic sphere. That's okay. If you get imaginative outside that, disaster is death chaos will, will, will ensue. And that's basically the essence of right-wing ideas. Uh, essentially, the difference between conservatism and fascism, they both agree with that, right? If you unleash the imagination in the political sphere, only disaster will ensue. Conservatives, therefore, don't want to um, unleash the imagination in the political sphere, and, and fascists want to do it anyway. Um, but, you know, the opposite of that is, is what I call political ontologies of the imagination, because if, and this goes back to, um, Oh, the the real origins of what we call the left, um, because whether you have Marx and the idea of production, and of course Marx starts as a sort of romantic poet, actually, um, and, or you have this sort of more romantic, imaginative um, conception, the idea of uh, the hidden reality that we don't acknowledge, whereas on the right wing it's violence, you know, it's the left wing, it's somebody had to think this up, somebody had to produce it, somebody. Um, so ultimately that sort of imaginative production um, is the thing that nobody wants you to talk about. They just want to talk about exchange. Um, so the hidden reality on either sides is assumed to be the opposite. Um, yet at the same time, alienation occurs when those like principles of imagination and violence interact in, in ways that the violence sort of breaks up the structures of imagination. Um, 
in different ways. And it happens opposite. And, you know, you can have it either in the sort of classic Marxian way whereby, you know, the guys who actually get to design things are doing the imaginative work and, and the people on the bottom are doing the unimaginative, like, physical labor. Or you can do it the other way around, you know, which is most social relations, um, whereby it's the people on the bottom. You know, it's like the women who have to, like, manage the social relations and the guys are wandering around uh, obliviously. So that imaginative labor is, is deferred to the people, the, the subordinates. Um, now, so, so it goes deeper then than we are used to imagining. Um, but it makes sense that you know the ultimate uh, project, the ultimate neoliberal project of the last 30 years has been essentially to win this war on the imagination. Um, the ultimate victory of sort of right-wing sensibilities over left-wing ones is to convince people that imagination will lead, as in the superhero stories, um, you know, if unleashed beyond the sphere of consumption, only to death dis and destruction. So that at this point, you know, it's almost impossible for us to imagine this taking place. Um, I actually, um, you know, wrote originally about some of the stuff in an essay called Revolutions in Reverse, which was referred to earlier. Um, and I'm just going to end by by comparing that with uh, a recent experience of mine. How am I doing for time? I'm just, I'm, I've got five minutes. Oh, okay, I okay, can do that. Um, yeah, um, because you know, in revolutions in reverse, I realize that the basic fantasy of revolution is exactly that you can dissolve away those structures of violent inequality, of structural violence, by basically taking out the violence in one punch, you know? It's all centralized in the state. Ultimately, the state is the you know, upholder of the, all of these orders of different types of structural violence. And if we just, like, get rid of the army and police and, you know, um, there'll be a whole series of things will happen. So you have, like, the great battle where you take out the violence, and then you go from there to, well, the first reaction is, you know, happy parties on the streets. Yay, we won the revolution. Um, generalized festivity, then you go from there to creating all the workers' councils and directly democratic institutions where you gradually reconstruct their everyday life and everyday social relations and your sense of self and person and, you know, invent a new man, as they used to call it. Um, and I realize that, you know, what's happened since that has come to seem re unrealistic to people is that we have this idea of direct action, the global justice movement, I notice this over and over again, and the same uh, analysis could probably be applied to a lot of what happened in Occupy, although I think things have changed slightly. Um, what I realize is that actually you have exactly the same sequence now in, in, in the opposite order. Um, rather than starting with the violent confrontation with the forces of order, then having the great parties in the streets, and then going from there to like creating the direct, direct democracy and gradually transforming everyday life and identities, you start with these identity groups um, that are like, you know, whether they're punks or hippies or, you know, all sorts of different, you know, uh, factions of, of, of radical, uh, what they used to denounce as lifestyleists, um, you know, people who are already trying to reconstitute their everyday life. They get together, form directly democratic institutions. Um, they do that in order to organize giant parties in the streets, which then lead to the people coming and beating them up in battles. Um, so it's actually happening in reverse order to the old um, paradigm, because partly because um, that idea that you can just like sort of take out the violence and everything will happen by itself is just no longer viable. And, and, and I think... Uh, Feminism, in particular, and its emphasis on process and the movement, has you know made it impossible for us to imagine it's that simple. In fact, you do have to start from the other side. Um, so, so you know, revolution becomes no longer this this apocalyptic thing, but this constant, ongoing process. Which means, in, you know, in some ways, you can act as if you're already free now. And that's the, the idea of direct action, but always incompletely and imperfectly. Um, on the other hand, I think that one of the, the key, uh, and, and I just got back, I should explain, um, my head is still filled with this stuff. I just came back from a trip to uh, Rojava in, in northern Syria. I was there for 10 days. Um, I just got back a week ago. Um, and I realized that you know, there's, there's a lot of other people who are thinking along these same lines and are reading the same stuff who come up with, with new revolutionary paradigms. And I, I think it's a sign of the war on the imagination, the highest sign of the war of imagination, that like even people on the left don't seem to be able to really believe it's actually happening. Or, or um, 
I was, you know, we've all been entranced for the last three months, and most people who read the news, have all these images of like women carrying machine guns, right? And you know, this sort of feminist army, um, um, well, at least women's army, and sometimes it's put down to well, it's a traditional Kurdish thing, I guess, you know. Um, and um, I've been in contact with some of the people who've been organizing that, that um, for some time, and in a way. Uh, you know, I was aware that that this has to do a very self-conscious ideological um, process that's been going on for at least 20 years now um, within social movements in the area. But you know, what I find fascinating is if you go there, like everybody says the same thing. It's like we've been having a social revolution for three years now. Why don't you guys notice? You know, <laughs> why is nobody interested? We, you know, we're doing all these interesting experiments. Um, so, so, so. You know, I was there, like, just to give you a sense of what's going on, right? Um, uh, you know, the first place we went was a police academy. It was like a place that, like, the Syrian regime used to use to torture people, had now been converted to a police academy. But their idea of a police academy was a place where, ev there, you know, they have six-month trainings, and you have to take courses on feminist theory before you're allowed to touch a weapon, for example. Um, and... Um, this, these, they're basically said there. Well, you know, this is a police academy. But our basic idea is we want to give everybody in the entire country six weeks of police training, and then we can abolish the police. Because <laughs> if everybody knows how to do it, then you don't need specialists. Um, you know, and like so, everybody could just be part of their local peace and consensus committee, as they call the local justice thing. Um, and you know, they set up directly democratic assemblies on all these different levels, and every assembly had, you know. Uh, was, it had to have 50, 50 gender parity, but at the same time, it was matched by an all-women's council that had veto power, and this existed on every level, like from the neighborhood up through the districts to the cities. Um, and, and the most interesting thing, though, was that they had created a dual power system, and I've never heard of this happening anywhere in history. These guys had gone off and created a dual power situation um, where they'd created both sides. <laughs> So essentially, they created a bottom-up system of like sort of of, of directly democratic groups which were armed um, and ac actually in control. They're the ones who could like you know talk to the, the security forces and, and access them, and then uh, um, that they were ultimately answerable to. And then they created a government um, with ministries and a parliament, which basically had no power for foreign consumption. Um, and. One reason they did it is because, well, I mean, partly, again, it's exactly the same thing as the car. You can't actually, you know, well, you can't have an airport, for example, and fly a plane unless you're a government. Um, you know, it's exactly the same thing. Um, you act, you know, you, there's all these different laws and signatory, and it assumes a top-down structure, just like the way if you want to own a car and pretend to be a corporation, you have to create that. So they created a dummy government. It looks just like a government, except it lacks any access to mechanisms of coercive power. They can't shoot anybody, like the army and 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 the and the army elects their officers. It's also bottom up. Um, the army and, and and the police are not answerable to it, but rather to like a bottom-up structure. Um, but what I what I, everybody who talked about is like, yeah, this is amazing. We're just totally reconstituting society. We've got a plan. He said we're anti-capitalist, and we decided that, um, you know, if you want to get rid of capitalism, you can't do it without getting rid of the state. Um, but if you want to get rid of the state, you can't do that without getting rid of pa patriarchy. So we're going to do that. Um, and and this is the logic which lies behind this thing. But but the, the fascinating thing is that I should have to tell this because. You know, like they're willing to tell this to anybody who's willing to listen, but as far as I know, like nobody knows this stuff. Be and, and, and even though they're, you know, w you have these fascists attacking them, there's been a battle going on for three months, there's daily headlines, everybody's looking at the story. Nobody seems capable of just like getting through their heads that this is actually a, a social revolution. Um, I was trying to write up an article in for the New York Times. We got like the commander at Kobani, a uh, woman named Maisa Abdo, um, to write. Uh, we got her an uh, op-ed op -ed piece in the New York Times, and they just kept changing the language because it just like couldn't, you know. So essentially, like she originally wrote, like this is a social revolution and it's led by women, and they, by the time that it went through the editing process, it was like this is a total social mobilization, many of whose leaders are women. <laughs> you know, it's just like the, the, the basic ideological message that there's something going on here. It's just like inconceivable. It cannot be communicated. Um, and and it so struck me that, that that inability to even conceive of the possibility that something like this could be happening is the ultimate sign that, you know, the sort of war of imagination has even worked on many factors of the people who call themselves the left. So maybe on that note, we can... <laughs>
go over to the next speaker in discussion. Mm -hmm.